Hey, hey, I'm Shay Keister, and I'm your host for the Casual Cattle Conversations podcast, the beef producer's place to explore new management practices. Thanks for tuning in, and welcome to the community. Hey, folks, thanks for tuning in to another episode. It's Shay here. Today's episode is all about virtual fencing. So I am visiting with Jack Keating with Corel Technologies, and we are going to dive into how cattle producers can set up virtual fencing, who virtual fencing is for, because we all know that technology might not be for every operation. And we're really also going to dive into the ROI of it. Jack shares some numbers on, you know, what does it cost to implement his program, as well as how do those numbers translate to if you would just continuously build your own cross fences and um, continually update those as well. So we offer some real figures in there as well. So I'm pretty excited about that. Before we dive into that episode, I do want to let you know that I am open for speaking gigs for the remainder of the year. So if you're interested in having anyone come talk to your crew about podcasting, entrepreneurship, advocacy, those are all in my wheelhouse, all topics I love to discuss, whether that's a keynote or a workshop. So And I also do virtual events too. But with that, let's get on with today's episode. All right, Jack, it is a pleasure to have you on the show. I know you were able to speak with my Rancher Mind group about virtual fencing and your company Corral Technologies a few months ago. And that was a lot of fun because I know we've talked a lot about actual fences on my show. Not that virtual fencing isn't an actual fence, I guess, but you know, we think of that physical barrier. So I'm excited to hear and have you share about what virtual fencing has to offer beef producers. So thanks for hopping on today. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to uh, kind of share our experiences and what we're doing at Corral uh, with everyone and answer some of your questions. Yeah. So to jump right into it, what is Corral Technologies? Like what's your company have to offer right now? What are you doing in the beef industry? So with Corral, we've created a virtual fencing system. If uh, anyone knows like shot collars for dogs, it's kind of similar to that, uh, but for cows. But instead of having to bury wires underground, ranchers are able to actually draw their fences on their phone, computer, or tablet. They put a collar on those cows and they're able to contain those cows, move them from one pasture to another, and also track where they've been and get some other data uh, from those cows. So this is like not a substitute for a permanent like barrier though right like this is just essentially more for like cross fencing yep so it's it's mostly for the cross fencing side um there is a perimeter fence there needs to be a perimeter fence around an operation uh one reason being the cows are the only animals that wear the system so if you have calves out there they can get out and also it's a second barrier there uh, just to make sure those cows stay within that property no matter what so i'm curious how do you train the cows how do you get them to like listen because i know i don't know i feel like some of our old boss cows might be a little ornery so how does that work no doubt it's it's strange and even when we first started working on corral it was strange to see how the cows reacted right uh sometimes when you're in the corral working them they don't necessarily listen all the time um and watching them turn 180 degrees just off of a beep is very strange to see um so so the training process really looks like a five, 14 day period, depending on your cows. Usually we give them um, a majority of the pasture. It, you know, you have four sides of a current pasture you have. Uh, we give them a majority of that pasture and basically a third or a fourth of it is cut off where they shouldn't be able to access that fourth. And they only have one side of a virtual boundary to actually interact with. That way they aren't getting too confused. Um, and of course, they're going to walk that fence. They're going to figure out, okay, I get sound, I get more sound, and then I get sound and shock. And that sound means I need to turn around. Um, so through that period, they kind of learn it on their own. Um, and they, they come back into the pasture, they walk the fence again, and they go back in and out until they figure out, okay, I need to not go uh, past that sound. Well, that's really interesting. And you said the calves do not wear collars. So you just kind of rely on natural herding to try and keep the calves in with the cows then? Yep. Just that natural herding and you still have that perimeter fence there. So they're going to be on your operation, uh, but they'll stay, you know, near those mama cows, make sure they get the milk um, and everything like that. So we'll dive a little bit more into the implementation process later, but I want to take a second and talk about the big picture of what you're doing. So what is 
the impact of virtual fencing? Like, why is this going to be a big solution to cattle producers? I think the biggest impact um, that I see is really being able to implement any management technique that you want to uh, with relative ease, right? Uh, initially, when we started, when I started Corral, I just didn't want to dig fence posts anymore. Um, digging post holes wasn't my favorite, and I figured there had to be an easier way to do it. And now we look at, okay, we can do any management technique we want to, given the year, whether it's really wet or really dry, you can really do whatever you need to. And having that flexibility to either do rotational grazing or break up those pastures uh, less or more, however the rancher needs to, and being able to potentially carry more cows, but also save time for those producers throughout the year. So what types of producers are you seeing adopt this technology right now because it is so new? It's been interesting. You know, we've get out, gotten outreach from ranchers from across the globe and talking to ranchers from South Africa to Canada to New Zealand to Nebraska. Uh, you know, you have a wide variety of people interested in using the system and very different use cases altogether. Um, but a majority of the people that have been reaching out to us are uh, ranchers with less than, I would say, 200 head. They have another job uh, that they're working off farm majority of the time. They're doing some sort of rotational grazing right now. They want to either increase the number of moves or be able to just take that time constraint out of their, their life and be able to just move those cows remotely and set up those fences at the touch of a button instead of going out there and, and building the fence after their normal day. So you've talked about, you know, the cows have collars and setting that fence up at the t with a touch of a button. So what are all the components that go into setting up a virtual fencing platform for herds? So really there's the collars and then also the software. So on the software side, that's where you can use it on a, on a computer or phone or a tablet. Uh, usually I use a computer to draw out all of our pastures. This is a lot easier from, from my point of view to draw pastures on there with a mouse and, and then clicking with a finger. Um, and then once you get that the pastures drawn out, you're able to actually put those collars on the cow. So with our system, you actually tap a collar with your phone. It pulls up a little dashboard, says enter tag number. You enter that cow's tag number, press OK. Um, then you can put that collar on the cow. It is an adjustable collar. So no matter the size, you're able to kind of adjust it, make sure it fits that cow well, and then you're good to go. That's pretty much all you need to do. Uh, you'll assign those cows to a herd, and then you can assign that herd into a pasture. One of the nice things is you can have as many herds as you want out there, um, as many ranches as you want, no matter where they're located. Uh, so you can have pastures that are, you know, hundreds of miles away if you want to, right? And mm -hmm. still be able to have different herds, different operations, and also add as many people as you want onto that, that software platform. So you could have your husband, wife, whoever it is, um, you know, add them onto that platform and be able to see notifications, be able to see what's going on at the ranch at all times. So there's no other like tower that goes with it. Like how does it operate? Does it operate off of like a cell tower? Is it, I mean, I'm assuming it's not Wi-Fi if they're out in the pasture, but like, what is this running off of? Yes, there's no tower. There's no infrastructure needed from the producer standpoint, which is nice. There's nothing to go move around or mess with. Um, or worry about out in the pasture. And so it's just the callers. Those callers communicate directly right now with cellular. Um, so the cows transmit their data over cellular that goes into the software platform and you're able to see their locations. Right now we're sending that data up every about 15 minutes. So it's fairly real time on where those cows have traveled uh, throughout that 15 minute period. And then eventually we hope to get to a satellite as a backup um, there. So it'll use cellular most of the time if you have it. And then if not, we'll go to that satellite uh, transmission and be able to send that data that way. So we can go anywhere, do anything with these callers. So what what's the cost of a system like this? Yeah, so right now we're charging $250 upfront per caller and then $50 a year for a use fee. So the first year is $300. Every year after that is $50. That includes the callers, the software, all the communication costs, and also warranty on the device um, to where we'll replace it basically anywhere within the first two, three years. Um, if it's broken, lost, end of life, that kind of thing. 
So where does the ROI come into play? Because that's every cattle producer's big question when it comes to an input cost, especially with the way prices are today. I mean, it's a big concern for cattle producers. So how can cattle producers kind of determine if they're going to get a return on investment with virtual fencing as opposed to doing what they've already been doing with the supplies they have? Yeah, that's something whenever we're looking at any of these technologies about implementing them into the farm, you got to look at the ROI. It has to make economical sense for the producer. So right now we're looking at the biggest one in my mind is increase in carrying capacity of an operation. Um, now that could mean you, you add more cows to your herd, you have more days on pasture, reducing your winter feed, or fewer rented acres out there, saving you quite a bit of money there, or time savings in terms of being able to maybe stay at your off-farm job for longer and make more money that way, or be able to do other jobs on a ranch because there's, there's no end to the amount of tasks that you can do out there on an operation. And so there's the time and kind of opportunity costs there. And then also potentially labor savings. You have somebody out there building fence and monitoring it all the time. You can now do that at the, at the touch of a button. And then, of course, there's also the pasture health, increasing forage yield, forage quality, and potentially increasing the calf weights there, the weaning weights of those calves. And then also just healthier cows overall. Now, you mentioned, um, you know, increasing, you know, improving your soil health, improving your forages and overall pasture quality. Do you offer any assistance in helping producers determine what type of grazing strategy they could use? Or is that something where you encourage them to reach out to other resources? Because ranchers are jacks and jills of all trades. We have so much going on that we can't be an expert in everything. You know, we might know bits and pieces of what we should do, but to be a true expert, we, we can't do that in everything. So do you offer any resources like that for customers to help them understand what type of grazing system they should look at? And right now we do not. We would recommend reaching out to a local resource, whether that's NRCS or another grazing uh, group nearby. And, and one of the big things I found out, because I grew up ranching in north central Nebraska, it's different everywhere, right? And there are so many different systems and different ways that you should graze that, that work in certain areas and don't work in other areas. And that's one of the pieces that I've been trying to work through is how do we help the ranchers get the most out of the system? Um, and I think the best way is to, to currently reach out to local resources there that know the forage types, know the actual rainfall, know how to graze in your area, uh, because we are not experts in every area either. And I don't want to act like one, um, and I don't want to mess anyone's grazing system up. Well, thanks for being honest with that. And I, I do think it's all about having the right team for what we're doing as cattle producers. Now you mentioned, you know, you talked, we just talked about ROI, but you also mentioned data collection. And I know on the show, I've talked a lot about how data collection can be a huge part of getting your ROI, especially out of technology. So what data are you collecting on these cows right now? Yeah. So right now we have total activity um, of that cow which eventually we can kind of equate into is that cow off, off kilter? Is it, is it doing something strange? Is it potentially sick? Or does that relate to other health issues? Um, we also provide a heat map for where those cows have grazed. So you can choose kind of whatever time period you want to and be able to see, all right, they're grazing heavily in this area, but they haven't touched this other half of the pasture. Do I need to draw a new fence over there and actually contain them on that side of the pasture so I can get all of my pasture used and I'm not leaving a bunch out there unutilized. Um, so that's one of the features there. And then eventually we really do want to get into that health, um, the health items as well. Uh, so we want to be able to tell if that cow is sick. We will, probably won't be able to tell directly what disease or what's happening with that cow, but it, it's activities off. Something's going on there to where that cow isn't doing normal, normal things. And then if that cow's in heat, calving, those are kind of the big ones we really want to implement in. And then eventually getting into potentially, you know, nutrition, grazing time per cow um, and things like that. And I think we're going to see a lot of different things come to come out after this, mm -hmm. right? Uh, I think we're going to have more devices out than have ever been out before and across a variety of different terrains. And what what can we pull from that, right? Whether it's genetic differences or, or something like that to where we give these ranchers all the tools and we give this cow a score, and say, hey, this cow is this cow's really good, or this cow's bringing down your average. You know, you might need to get her out of the herd and keep back a different calf from a from a better cow. 
So with the collars, are they, you know, you said they're adjustable so that they can fit the sizes of cows. I mean, how bulky are they? Because like for me, it's hard to imagine like going out to see my herd and have these collars around them. So how bulky are they? Like what do they kind of look like on the cows? Right now, the total collar, this is just a rough demo one I made at home. But right now, the collar total length is about 15 inches from side to side. And then basically, it's, it's completely flexible. It forms to basically any breed, which is really nice. One of the things we implemented in this V2 design, and then it's got a two-inch strap there that goes down to a counterweight. And that counterweight keeps everything centered on top of that cow. It is, a, it is strange to go out and see, right? Versus what you're normal normally going to go out to your pasture and see and seeing them wear those collars. It doesn't seem to bother the cows really at all. You know, the first minute after you put them on, uh, it's kind of a rodeo. They'll go, mm -hmm. they'll go buck a little bit. Um, but after that, they go back to their normal behavior and they're out there in the pasture grazing, doing everything they need to. So at what age are producers typically starting to train? Is it like when yearlings are getting kicked out? Is it, cause you said calves aren't wearing them. So at what point do you put collars on cows? It's the youngest cows we've had uh, where the collars are bred heifers. Um, so if that's the youngest we've tested on. Now we're going to be doing some tests on younger cows this fall, most likely. Uh, but for right now, it's mostly been on the cows uh, and really any age we've seen it be, be operating just fine. Those bred heifers actually worked really, really well uh, comparatively to the older cows. And so we're going to be basically any, any age is kind of optional. Those smaller cows or calves or yearlings um, are something we need to test out the system more on to make sure it fits them well, everything is nice and easy to put on for them uh, versus those older cows. So my next question is what happens when producers have their herd trained and then they buy a bull from someone else during breeding season? How do you train that bull? Or do you just rely on the bull to stay with the cows that are in heat? Yeah, so we have not put any collars on bulls yet. Uh, we are going to be putting some on this summer. And really, that goes back to the data side. You know, what can we pull from the bulls? Uh, containing them is going to be a potential issue there, uh, just based on, you know, personal experience with bulls. Uh, they they may not listen quite as well as the cows. Uh, so we'll see if we can do any containment, but it's more so on the data collection and seeing what can we pull from that bull. You know, how many cows is it? Is it riding a day or is it doing any work out there? Or is it just laying in the corner? Um, something that we need to know. Or also, is that cat bull out of the pasture? Um, you know, everyone sometimes loses a bull. And we lost one last year, which did not help our, our preg rates at all. But um, ideally, we can get that data. So the bulls don't necessarily need to be contained. Most likely going to stay with the herd, gather and heat. And then you, there shouldn't really be any issues there. So when you think about producers implementing this technology and any technology, what do they need to keep in mind as they are trying something new and using technology? Because I feel like sometimes ranchers are a little behind when it comes to using technology compared to other industries. So what do they just need to keep in mind as they're going through these new processes of implementing and trying new things? Yeah, I think, you know, there's there's going to be a learning curve, right? Just like with anything new you try, there's going to be a little bit of a curve there, whether it's putting on the collars and understanding how to do that properly, or just drawing out pastures and how to do that uh, really efficiently. There's going to be a learning curve, but also this is an investment. Um, in my mind, it's a long-term investment, uh, similar to kind of what, what a normal fence would be. And ideally, if we can keep that mindset to where this is a long-term investment to use this system over time, um, then we, I think it makes a lot more sense in terms of the, the ROI and the payback for these producers. That's one of the big things I want to keep on the front of people's minds. So from a big picture standpoint, how do you see virtual fencing of any kind impacting the beef industry? What do you think that biggest impact is going to be in the next 10 years with this technology? biggest impact in the next 10 years hmm. i think um i think one of the big impacts that we're going to be able to see is hopefully increased profitability of ranches 
right? That's what that's what my goal is. I want to make sure ranchers can continue ranching um, because for for a lot of ranchers, I think it's the most uh, excited, motivated group of like business people there is, right? They they might go out in negative twenty and get their butt kicked one day, and then the next day they wake up and they're ready to do it again, right? And it's very uh, it's very hard to find people that are so excited and love what they do so much, and it's really a dream for all these ranchers to continue ranching. And so I want to be able to increase that profitability. I think that's what virtual fencing can do, right? We can increase profitability to these ranches because it's obviously needed uh, with the input costs rising and really your outputs are staying constant. How can we get the most out of what we currently have and how can we utilize it efficiently is one of the big things I think we're going to see in the next 10 years. And then also that on the data side, what else can we pull in, right? What else are we going to be able to provide these producers to say, okay, now we can really look at this and get down into, into the, the nitty gritty of these operations and see how can we improve the profitability? So when you were like doing your customer validation and research to figure out if this would work, did you do any cost analysis on what it costs to like start using virtual fencing as opposed to the cost of like building your own cross fences and constantly maintaining those because it's not, I mean, you have costs every year, whether you're rebuilding new fence or just, you know, replacing a clipper insulator here or there or a broken wire. So there's regular inputs there every year. Did you do any cost breakdown or analysis on that for the average producer? Yeah, so we looked at we looked at uh, one cost analysis that was done on it was just done on barbed wire fence and I think high tensile fence, and then we put in our numbers to that as well. And so that was 3,200 3, acre operation, basically with no fence, right? And then they were going to break up that pas- break up that operation into ten different pastures, and that cost there. What does that look like over a twenty year span in terms of maintenance? Um, upkeep and everything like that. And really, it's pretty wild at what it came out to. You know, like a 20 year total on barbed wire, we pulled it up. It's about 4 million total for that um, because they're, this is with no fence, of course. So a lot of that's an installation cost. And then for virtual fencing, um, of course, you still need the perimeter fence there, but it should come out to about 1.5. So you're saving quite a bit of money um, just in that. But of course, for a lot of these operations, they may already have that fence there and in and, and there. Uh, but if they wanted to break up those pastures even more, then that cost is going to be even higher. And, and really, I think this virtual fencing takes that out of the picture. It takes a lot of that maintenance potentially out of the picture as well. So what are people who are using it saying? Like, what are they really enjoying about the product right now? So right now we're doing a lot of testing mm-hmm. internally um, and on my family's operation. And this summer, we're going to be putting out a lot more devices and being able to get a lot better feedback from producers. I think a lot of the producers that are going to be using the system this year are excited about, um, I think, a lot of the time savings, right? And being able to move those cows because a lot of them are doing uh, some sort of moving at least once a week at at this point. And maybe they want to go to even more frequent moves um, and, and being able to save that time out there is really exciting for them. And not even just, I don't want to spend time at my operation. Like, that's not what they're saying. Uh, but they want to spend less time fixing fence mm-hmm. and, and building fence and more time actually maybe enjoying the cows, walking the pastures, understanding what's really going on out there uh, and being able to pay closer attention to those animals and their pastures at the same time. So say I want to start implementing this on my operation what steps does that look like? Can you briefly walk me through step-by-step? Step? I feel like you've covered a lot of the steps, but it wasn't necessarily in order. So can you give me a quick step-by-step step of what it looks like to implement this? Yeah. So step-by-step step for implementing our system, the first thing is hop on a call with me. I'm available. I want to know you know, what your operation looks like. Do you have a perimeter fence? Is it going to really make sure it makes sense to that operator and make sure they're going to get the ROI because that's the biggest thing we want to we want to implement there. And then after that, we'll make sure that that rancher wants a system. It's going to work on their operation. They have cell service. Um, and then after that, we can get them logged into our software system. And uh, they'll go in and draw out all of their pastures on their operation. And at that point, we can send out callers to them. Currently, we're sending those out in the spring. 
Uh, so next spring is really our next big rollout there. Um, and those ranchers can begin putting those collars on. Usually, if you run them through a branding time to give them, you know, dewormer or spray them, you can put the collars on at that time. And it's fairly quick uh, to put those collars on and then assign those cows to a herd and assign that herd into a pasture and, and begin that training process. Like I said before, that, that takes five to 14 days, um, depending on kind of those cows and, and kind of the environment they're in. And then after that, those ranchers can start putting those cows to out to pasture. And ideally, that device lasts two years, right? So you shouldn't have to touch it uh, for that two-year period. You know, if you bring them in, check it, does everything look right? Does it need adjusted at all? And then put those cows back out to pasture. So there's minimal handling that we wanted uh, producers to have, minimal interaction, uh, because there's the time at the shoot, you don't want to spend necessarily more time at the shoot than you have to. So being able to not have those extra touch points was really important for us. So with where that collar sits, how does that, is it high enough up where it doesn't become a problem when cows are coming through the chute or like, where is it exactly sitting on their neck? So it's kind of sitting on the side of their neck. Uh, so it does get a little difficult to catch them in there um, with, with ease, I would say. Uh, it still is, you can do it pretty easily, but if you get them caught in a chute and, you know, if you buzz them and they run up the chute pretty quick and you got to, you got to close it. Uh, then there could be some, some issues there with getting them caught, but most of the time there's no issues. And we run a manual chute at home and that, that works fine. And the collar is pretty, pretty robust to where this, there's an inner shell, which is like polycarbonate. Mm -hmm. And then the outer shell is really a shock absorbent rubber there. So it can get smashed pretty good um, because that's what the environment really requires us to do. So, how are you different from other virtual fencing companies? Because you're not the only one out there. There, I feel like these ag tech companies are popping out of the woodworks. They're just coming like crazy. So how are you different? I think one of the big things there is that, you know, came from a ranching background. And so that comes into any of our designs, any of our, you know, algorithms we build in, um, that knowledge kind of goes in, right? Time at the shoot. How do we put it on? What side should we have the rancher tap? Uh, because that's a side of, you know, most most corrals um, and being able to have that knowledge implemented into our design process is I think pretty huge um, and then also we don't have that infrastructure out there right some of these companies have base stations that you need on your operation cost ten to twelve thousand um, dollars which is a large upfront cost for that cost for that base station and if that base station goes down your your virtual fencing is down um, so really that backup for having multiple callers that can connect to cell service and still be operating out there uh, really allows us to be able to go anywhere, do anything. You don't have to have multiple base stations and these cows can be hundreds of miles apart and there's no issues there. And then also we have directional stimulation so we can give sound or shock on the right side or the left side, depending on where that cow's facing. So if you give it on the right side, the cow turns left, left side, the cow turns right. And then one of the other big ones is we have solar charging on the devices right? You don't need to go change batteries every six months, um, which in my mind is, is a lot of added work that I wouldn't necessarily like to do while I'm at the shoot. You know, if you're going to add a few hours to me at the shoot, I when it doesn't excite me. So being able to have those fewer touch points is, is pretty huge. And then I think there's a few other on the data analytics side that aren't necessarily built out yet, but I think we're going to have some improved data analytics. And also on the software side, we have that mobile app where you can go find callers out in the pasture if you need to and look at your phone. You can connect to callers out in the pasture, collect data, send move notifications while you're out there, and then also have that grazing plan feature in the software to track that over time and also automate moves and record keeping if a rancher does want to utilize it for record keeping. All righty, Jack. Well, is there any, do you have any final thoughts that you want to share before we wrap up today? Yeah, I think if anyone's interested in seeing the system actually in use, our goal is to have quite a few field days this fall, most likely in that October time. Um, hopefully we'll have one in North Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Iowa, and Texas is what we're shooting for. Um, so if you're interested in that, feel free to reach out to me and we'll get you out there. We can see the system in use, hear producers talking about it, um, and be able to kind of see what that potentially looks like on your actual operation. All right, Jack, thank you very much for being on the show today. Thank you, Shay. Appreciate it. Thank you for uh, all you do. And 
That's a wrap on that one, folks. Thank you for tuning in today and joining in on the conversation. Be sure to take this a step further and take the advice you learned and implement it on your operation. If you want to have a conversation about it, head over to my social media and send me a DM by following at Cattle Convos and connecting with me there. Have a great day.